Well, so we'll start to get gently underway. Um, so I'm Adam Hug. I'm the outgoing director of the Foreign Policy Centre uh, in what is uh, an emotional moment for me. This is my last uh, uh, last event that I'm chairing as uh, the FPC's director. Um, but um, what we are doing today is talking about the work of uh, a loose coalition of experts and NGOs, uh, the Britain as a force for good in Central Asia working group, um, who have been working to sort of raise awareness inside, uh, inside the UK about the UK's role in Central Asia uh, and to try and get a better understanding about how uh, Britain is seen in the region, what it can do to help uh, influence events, um, and uh, and sort of understanding the deeper links between Britain and the region. We have gone through a very uh, interesting year, uh, one of um, a bit of uncertainty and instability, both in Central Asia and in the UK. Um, we have um, started this year uh, with the uh, unrest and crackdown in Kazakhstan. Obviously, you don't need me to tell you um, sort of the global impact of Russia's uh, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and one of the things that we have been looking at uh, is the impact of, the, of that event, both on the situation in the region and obviously the future contours of UK foreign policy as it relates to the post-Soviet space more generally, um, but also it's been a, a, an event that certainly in the early phases took up a lot of uh, institutional bandwidth inside uh, Britain and other Western governments, um, obviously to respond to the, 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 the challenge. Um, you've seen obviously recently seen dynastic change in Turkmenistan, which uh, while well, we can get to in Q&A, but it's not one of the ones that we're focusing on today. But we've seen, yeah, seen process of, yeah, massive changing in, 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 in Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, the, yeah, embedding of the, uh, uh, of the Japarov um, ruling group in the country. Uh, and obviously, you know, you know, a, a challenging time for Uzbekistan, uh, as well and that's those three countries that we're going to focus on today um, and as you will have seen in the chat we are going to do some initial um, comments from our three working group members uh, today and then we are going to uh, go to, to question and answer so please put your question and answer questions in the Q&A box and then we will get to them once our three speakers have spoken. Uh, so first of all I would like to introduce our panel who are Professor Christian Laslett, who is Professor at Ulster University and the co-director of UZ Investigations. Uh, Dr. Khalida Azigulova, who is the Associate Professor at Eurasian Technological University. And Dr. Aijan Shoshinova, who's the Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the OSC Academy in Bishkek. Um, so uh, if we can start uh, with Chris and then we'll go around. Thanks very much. Great. Well, thank you, Adam, and thanks for all the work you've done over the years on on Central Asia. And um, you know, it's been great having you host these events and support the work that's being done. And um, it's really delightful to be on a um, a panel like this. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk quickly um, about the situation in Uzbekistan, and and to do so with the caveat to say my background is I do complex investigations into corruption and kleptocracy, and that's what I've been working on primarily in Uzbekistan, to which I have the most um, granular knowledge of. Um, so so that will be a slight slight. Um, slightly more greater focus of, of what I'm about to say um and I'm, I'm I'm taking this kind of this comment part of the of the of the seminar um at at sort of in a in an idealistic sense that 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 actually you know that's what statecraft is about and that's what foreign, good foreign policy is about is trying to do good um and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep to that 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 virtuous view um in an idealistic sense um and proceed on that basis and I think in Uzbekistan at the moment, uh, I think since um, President Mirziyoyev came to power following the death of Islam Karimov um, in late August of um, 2016, we've seen a number of real core tendencies to which foreign partners would need to be responding. And I think I'll start with the more controversial one. Um, I would argue that we've seen the intensification of kleptocracy. We've seen um, dynastic families at the very um, uh, uh, heights of political power in Uzbekistan increase their wealth 
through self-enrichment strategies using the authoritarian state apparatus. And this has increased and expanded over the last um, six years. It hasn't decreased. Um, so secondly, we've seen the professionalization or move to professionalize the civil service and the public administration by bringing in uh, each, by you know, training, bringing in uh, expertise from abroad, um, and and that's again a, it's often been categorised as a part of the modernisation strategy for authoritarian regimes. Um, a third tendency that we've seen is um, the government has been attempting to enact a range of reforms to create a more positive environment for business, but in particular, the government is trying to expand the space for flows of private capital. So obviously Uzbekistan is a, is a region which has been historically dominated by the state sector in terms of economic activity. And there's been a more frenetic shift to, um, to encouraging private flows of capital um, through whether it be through privatization or open up different sectors to more um, um, private investment through joint venture structures. So that is a third tendency we've seen in Uzbekistan over the last six years. And I think the other final tendency has been, um, you know, given its football season, it's been a game of two halves. We saw um, in Uzbekistan, there was under the new Uzbekistan policy of, of Mr. Uh, of President Mazayev, we saw a relaxation around some of the more repressive elements of the state and, and some um, greater level of freedom for civil society. But we've also seen that being retracted over the last couple of years and obviously um, being most spectacularly with examples of bloggers being in, uh, imprisoned and beaten, uh, protesters being shot on the streets, uh, which brings back many um, sad memories from the, the Karimov era. Um, and I would say that, 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 that all those tendencies aren't contradictory. They're actually, so they actually integrate in a, in a um, syncopated manner, or a, that's because um, you, you, we see kleptocratic tendencies. We see ambitious dynastic families wanting to benefit from a growing private sector, which they will be in the, in the driver's seat in. And they know to do that, they need to have a much more professional sleek uh, public administration. So it's within the interests of those who are at the driving seat of kleptocracy to see a much more professional uh, uh, public administration, to see a much more modern um, uh, uh, environment for business with, uh, and, and, and also, uh, but it, it's critical that they remain in seats of political power. Um, and so the question then against that complex backdrop, what can someone like the UK do? To, to try and make a difference within that environment. And I think um, in that respect, um, you know, there's, there's the, if we're, we're saying what can, if Britain being a force for good, then clearly the only way to be a force for good is to be behind the people of Uzbekistan and, and to support them in their struggle for greater freedom, for greater democracy, for human rights. There's just no, I mean, if you want to be a force for good, there's just no other way of getting around that. And you can try and use all sorts of platitudes and, and, and nice diplomatic talk, but that's a reality. That's a hard fact. And if you're not part of that um, solution, then you're part of the problem. And that is a, that is a hard fact as well. And, and nothing that no diplomatic platitudes can get around. But that said, that doesn't mean that, that, that I'm suggesting the UK government should somehow become alienate itself from the, the regime. It's about how to support um, the, 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 the people of Uzbekistan and civil society through smart um, strategic approaches that, um, that do not alienate the government, but also give, but also strengthen the enabling environment for citizens and civil society in Uzbekistan. And I'll just finish with pointing to a couple of different ways that the UK could appeal to the Uzbek government's desire for modernization and for business growth, and at the same time, create a business and uh, create an environment that's enabling for civil society and finding that sweet spot. Um, and firstly, I think there's, uh, against what I just said, there's one thing that I think 
has to be done regardless of whether it's palatable to the um, regime or not. And that is to bear witness when human rights abuses occur, um, to bear witness to um, confiscation of private property, to, uh, to the persecution of bloggers and journalists uh, and citizens who are protesting. Because when the UK and other governments bear witness, that has a huge effect um, it, it just a simple act of bearing witness puts pressure on the government and also critically gives hope to the uh, people who are facing persecution, who feel that they've been isolated and forgotten by the international community. So the simple act of the UK speaking out against these abuses, observing them, going to courts and making sure that there's monitoring of what's going on in these cases and, and using its both informal and formal diplomatic um, powers to, to draw attention to them, even keeping in a polite and restrained manner, I think is, 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 is an important thing it can do. Um, secondly, um, it can, um, it, it, I think there's, in focusing on anti-corruption, there's clearly in order for Uzbekistan to integrate into the international economy, it needs to reach certain benchmarks that can also, in reaching them, improve the enabling environment for civil society. One area is corporate transparency. So at the moment, in the, obviously corporate transparency or the lack of it is critical to corruption and kleptocracy. And at the moment in Uzbekistan, there's very limited corporate transparency. You can access a company extract basically from the unified register and it's current. There's no historical records, there's no filings. Uh, the UK has been a leader in terms of corporate transparency. It's one of the first countries to have a open source company's house. It's one of the first countries to have a fully public um, ultimate beneficial owners register. And it, so therefore it has a strong claim to leadership in corporate transparency and is in a position to transfer that knowledge to Uzbekistan to support their own journey in meeting international standards in that front, which will be good for their commercial environment, will give much more security to their, or much more um, security to their, their, their commercial environment, and it will also create an enabling environment for civil society. Um, and the final thing um, uh, to say is that, again, another area where UK excels on uh, is to, its AML. The uh, UK has been a leader in anti-money laundering uh, uh, regulations and uh, anti-money laundering oversight. Uh, it's got, still got significant gaps, but it is, has been in my, it, it's got a lot of experience in this area and it has a huge financial sector. Um, and the, the, the journey in Uzbekistan is still at a much more prefatory stage. Yes, there's anti-money laundering laws, uh, but there's huge gaps in those laws. And there's huge gaps in the regulatory structure and there's a lack of capacity within the regulated institutions. Um, and this again creates an enabling environment for corruption to thrive and it also reduces the ability, it reduces the availability of, of accountability structures for civil society to use in their struggle against corruption and kleptocracy. So again, the UK working with the Uzbek government to um, uh, to do to, to support their AML reforms would be the, another area they could um, do good in Uzbekistan. And that's really me. I'll say one very final point, and that is that the failure to begin to tackle some of these issues, even if they might appear unpalatable, the reality is in, in Uzbekistan, the more kleptocracy and corruption roots itself and gets deeper, the more that gives leverage to uh, uh, um, to geopolitical actors who think many would accept have a fairly malevolent ambition in the region. And I talk in there in particularly to the Putin regime who absolutely love kleptocracy in Uzbekistan because it compromises its political leaders. It builds relationships with their own uh, experts in the kleptocratic crafts and, and brings Uzbekistan closer to those forces, the state. And, uh, and so therefore the kinds of things that the UK does also helps combat that, 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 that challenge as well. And that's it from me. Brilliant, uh, huge thanks for that, Chris, that setting up practical areas where the UK has expertise, has a track record, and bluntly has been making the case over the last year that it wants to finally deliver on some of its ambitions on anti-corruption reform here in the UK, as it relates to global kleptocracies, both with the first economic crime bill and the second economic crime bill. So you would hope that we're in a position where the UK government recognises that dimension uh, as a as a key uh, as a key thing go forward, but it's not not always been the case. Um, lovely. Can I hand over to Halida?
Thank you very much. Um, indeed, I believe that uh, the UK uh, can play a very crucial role uh, in several areas um, in Kazakhstan, and one of them is improving and strengthening the role of women in the decision at the decision making level in the area of peace and security as you know after the january events uh, this year uh, we saw this uh, we this um, rise in violence and uh, in our country. And uh, unfortunately, we also noticed that practically no women uh, were taking part in making decision and taking the decisions on um, in, in the response to the events and so on. And uh, right now in Kazakhstan, we are very much uh, engaged with um, implementing the resolution of the Security Council, UN Security Council 1325, on women's peace and security. And um, this year, uh, last year, the end of the last year, we adopted our national uh, mechanism on the implementation of the Security Council's uh, resolution. And I believe that the UK can definitely help the authorities, the government, uh, to increase the participation of women in prevention of conflicts, conflicts in, um, in terms of uh, negotiating and regularizing local conflicts and also um, in, in increasing in the role of women in any post-conflict situations. And uh, why it is also important, because we see that, um, again, in our region, that's definitely, we are affected. We are affected by the consequences of um, armed conflicts that are happening quite close to the borders uh, to the to the border of Kazakhstan. And definitely we believe that we need to have more um, women uh, at the highest decision-making level in law enforcement agencies and in the army. Unfortunately, in Kazakhstan since 1991, for the last 30 years, there was no woman at the highest decision-making level, either at the police ministry of interior or at the, uh, in, in the ministry of defense or in the army. We also don't have any woman who would be in charge of local police departments um, in any of the cities or regions in Kazakhstan. And of course, this all um, shows that basically it affects uh, the practices towards uh, the population. It shows that, uh, that unfortunately, we don't have sufficient, um, uh, I would say, uh, empathy in the approach of the police and uh, uh, law enforcement and soldiers when they treat uh, lo the local population. And um, another area where the UK could definitely uh, help improve uh, the situation in Kazakhstan is the response uh, to, uh, to gender-based violence. As you may know, in 2020, uh, we were developing and we were trying to adopt a new uh, law uh, against domestic violence. However, um, the bill was under attack, under very, um, I would say, unexpected attack from alt-right groups. And still the government uh, does not publicly announce who was behind that attack, who was fun funding those alt-right groups who were cyberbullying the members of parliament, who were cyberbullying uh, um, human rights activists. But unfortunately, the presidential administration decided to cancel, to withdraw the bill. And since 2020, we don't have any uh, new bill on domestic violence. And uh, what we see as the consequence is that the level of domestic violence and gender-based violence in Kazakhstan has skyrocketed. Uh, and for just to give you some examples, since uh, 2017, after decriminalization of domestic violence in Kazakhstan, the rate of uh, domestic violence cases increased by two and a half percent, uh, but uh, in increased by um, uh, increased uh, by uh, 250 percent. And uh, the, another problem is that unfortunately we see right now that. Um, the abusers, domestic abusers, no longer they are satisfied with just beating their members of family, but also they are intentionally killing, murdering their members of family. And just this year, we saw three cases of very horrendous and uh, terrible murders of children by their fathers in Kazakhstan. And these murders uh, were made uh, because uh, they, their fathers, their abusers, they wanted to hurt the mothers. And that's why they committed such crimes. So it, it's it's really horrible. And we see it also as a consequence, consequence of lack of adequate uh, prevention and response mechanisms from the government. And the third area where definitely uh, the UK could help 
uh, is um, I agree in the area of prevention of money laundering and helping uh, Kazakhstan to return the uh, the, the monetary assets uh, that were illegally transferred some time ago to the UK or, and so on. And uh, on the one hand, right now, yes, we know that the president Tokayev he has announced that now they will be returning all these illegal uh, all these assets back to Kazakhstan that were once uh, illegally um, taken now transfer from Kazakhstan. However, however, what I see is that we don't have this uh, universal approach, you know, so again, some assets are targeted, while other assets are not targeted at all, you know, and uh, especially what I wanted um, to mention is, for example, we have this uh, presidential scholarship, Bolashak, and uh, we there are some serious allegations that unfortunately even this scholarship was used to transfer illegally uh, state-owned assets uh, abroad. And, uh, and of course, we need definitely the support of the British government to help to uh, disclose, to uncover the scheme, to see how it was operated and who actually eventually gained illegally all these, uh, all these funds that were, um, that were transferred to the UK, for example. So this is all on my side. We'll be happy to answer the questions during the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, on that asset recovery thing, I'm aware that some Kazakhstan officials are, I believe, are attending, uh, visiting the UK this week uh, to try and uh, pick up on the uh, uh, on those on those assets that have been uh, been hit. So, yeah, the question is to what extent the UK is able to help, and obviously there is a challenge about who it is that the UK can help. Um, with, uh, uh, with 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 getting this back, is it just those who've fallen out of favour with the uh, with the transition change of government, and how, or how much of it is a broader systemic change? Uh, and obviously, we, we can have our slightly cynical views about that, but ultimately, any opportunity for progress is welcome. Um, brilliant. You can throw to Aishan, please. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you for being with us this morning and afternoon in Central Asia to discuss Central Asia again. Um, I will talk about Kyrgyzstan and highlight some of the issues which might be of interest for the audience, but also highlight how the UK could be uh, a force for good uh, in the region and in the country specifically. Um, so in the past two years, uh, the political landscape of Kyrgyzstan has been uh, signified with specific changes related to the arrival of a new leadership, which is very different from the previous presidents and previous uh, political leaderships in Kyrgyzstan. In a way, we had a change of political elites generations. Um, the old Soviet educated elites have been replaced by new ones with very suspicious backgrounds, very interesting, so to say, connections for the, the murky side of things. So, but in the last two years, Kyrgyzstan has seen a drastic change towards authoritarianism. This is not something new, but it has been quite intense in the past two years. Uh, for the first time in a while, Kyrgyzstan has been marked as, marked as not free uh, because of the political oppression and the difficulties faced by independent media. Just recently, we had uh, 24 political activists and civil society representatives detained. Um, they're currently in the prison. And this week, their temporary detention has been extended to the end of February. Uh, that was a committee that uh, civil society committee that requested the government uh, to be transparent about the border deals that have been happening in Kyrgyzstan in relation to uh, Kyrgyz Uzbek border. Uh, so 24 people are still detained, four of them are female political prisoners, and they, they have declared a hunger strike uh, this week. Uh, we also had a recent case of uh, further repression on free media. Uh, uh, Kyrgyz investigative journalist Bolot Temilov has been uh, not only detained, not only tried, but also he has been deprived of his Kyrgyz citizenship and deported to Russia, which is uh, a death sentence for a person uh, of a certain age, a male person of certain age. And he has been further prohibited to come to Kyrgyzstan for the next five years. So this has been quite outrageous, but uh, more specifically, there are concerns as well about the current political elites connections with um, organized crime, as well as uh, businesses, shadow businesses, also questions about the use of the budget, uh, how the finances are used because the president has certain preferences towards um, getting 
new jets or helicopters, well, the budget has got huge holes in terms of covering very basic things. There is also a very urgent issue of climate change, and I think winters uh, in Bishkek specifically, but all over Kyrgyzstan as well, have been particularly bad in terms of air quality. Uh, Kyrgyzstan has been steadily actually heading the, the suspicious, the not so good uh, ratings of the worst air quality around the world. Bishkek had up to 400, which is uh, hazardous. And obviously these issues are not addressed at the higher level. So how Britain could help us? Um, we have discussed that before, and I think quite a lot of it uh, still stands true uh, compared to the last year, that uh, the UK needs to continue working on um, anti-corruption and organized crime, helping Kyrgyzstan uh, track the budget or public funds that have been led astray by certain politicians and former officials, help us recover those assets which are much needed to cover the budget holes. Uh, secondly, the UK needs to continue working with civil society and independent mass media because these are two true agents of change in the country and whenever anything happens in the past 30 years, civil society and free mass media have been quite steady in terms of their resilience, their coverage, their public service, but they do need uh, external support. There is also the issue of climate change. And last year, our president had participated in the COP in Glasgow, and he made a number of commitments publicly. And I think the United Kingdom could follow up on that as well, and maybe turn the thinking of the current leadership more towards um, green thinking and environmental issues. And I think that should be easier now because the climate change is very much uh, plausible in Bishkek, and it's quite difficult to be a climate change denier if you're finding yourself in the city and you're struggling to breathe. Uh, so I think this is the good time to, to raise those conversations as well. But in addition to that, we still have some issues with uh, domestic violence and um, theme, rights of uh, female citizens, uh, similar to what Khalida has covered in Kazakhstan, similar issues are happening in Kyrgyzstan with some outrageous cases and to the point that some of independent journalists are calling it femicide, the way women are treated. And if you look at the uh, political prisons as well, the majority of them are usually female and uh, the majority of the vocal journalists are female as well. So I think the women of Kyrgyzstan need to be supported. Unfortunately, we have to rely on external help when it comes to voicing our opinions and basically existing in the political uh, area. But uh, the war in Ukraine has affected Kyrgyzstan as well, partly with the uh, labor migrant remittances uh, and partly by the availability of goods, including medical drugs, because quite a lot of them come from either Russia or Ukraine, and both countries have been affected by the war. So there are certain shortages in uh, medical uh, supplies, uh, as well as increasing prices, which are caused partially by the food prices which are partially caused by the uh, currency market fluctuations and partially by the availability of food, uh, which is also exported, uh, imported from Russia and Ukraine. So yeah, that's it, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Aisha. Um, if I can ask people who want to ask questions to so please put them into the uh, Q&A box uh, so I can see them. Um, Obviously, we've talked a lot, of, you know, with, with a, focusing on on what the situation is in Central Asia. But I think the first question that we've been asked is by Alex uh, Faux, um, who uh, points out that in his speech this week, for UK Foreign Secretary James cleverly indicated the UK would scale back on its ambition to see liberal values instilled in countries, including those in the Central Asian area. Instead, it would seek to build partnerships based on shared values, which Alex takes to mean uh, opening up of markets and encouraging investment, as well as potentially low-level defence and security partnerships. If carried through, does this mean the end of the hopes that the countries under discussion will improve their human rights and de democratic value improvements? Um, so I'll throw, so we'll, we'll take that to, to the panel, because that's 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 obviously about the UK side, and it, obviously not all panellists may want to respond on that, but certainly the, certainly the Brits on the panel, I think, should have a crack at this, because We've seen three prime ministers this year. We've seen, you know, 
you know, continuation of the aid cuts that were in uh, were, were delivered when the when the current prime minister was uh, transferred to the Exchequer a few years ago. Uh, uh, and obviously that does impact the UK's reach and ability to influence the situation on the ground. Uh, I would say that potentially the uh, the position on anti-corruption is get, has, at least has the opportunity to get slightly better, uh, certainly in terms of getting the UK's own house in order, which will be helpful for Central Asia, but with the extent to which the UK will be willing to push that in uh, in the region is unclear. And I think we are seeing the UK government with 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 with, with Foreign Secretary Clevery's speech and others begin to rethink the principles set out in its integrated review that was only published. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, um, in light of that political change in the UK, and obviously in light of events uh, such as uh, the war in Ukraine, which I think potentially will mean a greater focus on sort of Eurasia writ large, uh, and and sort of issues around European security and and looking seeing Russia as a as, as a as a bigger strategic challenge, uh, which may open up opportunities to think uh, uh, for the UK to rethink its role in Central Asia, but potentially creates risks in terms of seeing everything only through a Russian lens, um, which I'm concerned about. But more broadly, I think in terms of the cleverly situation, I think there's, there's there's two things. One, there are, as Chris said, opportunities to look at areas where market-based ambitions and uh, and human rights good governance ambitions run should run in parallel particularly around anti-corruption anti-money laundering those sort of things that the uk if the uk wants to do business and stable business in a place like uzbekistan getting those principles right is, is absolutely key otherwise it's incredibly high risk and will limit the amount of uh, investment that potentially go in but more broadly i think there is a broader case that we need to be making not only in light of uh, of, of russia ukraine uh, that we are in a broader strategic struggle, struggle between autocracy slash kleptocracy and democracy, uh, where there, where the UK, if it, it, it is in the UK's long-term strategic interest to keep banging the drum for good governance, human rights reform, because ultimately we've seen where oppressive regimes can get to and the security uh, challenges that they that they pose, as well as the the, the moral challenge to the, to the values that the UK has for many years proclaimed to hold. So I've spoken for a long time on that, but I'm happy to throw it to the rest of the panel because I think it's important just to understand the UK dimension of what the UK, you know, what the UK can or may be wanting to do. So I'll go to Chris and then if Ajahn or, or Khalid wants to come in, they can, uh, but well, then we'll get to some more directly Central Asia focused questions. Cool. Well, I'm happy to answer that. And I've uh, last year I pledged my allegiance to the Queen. So I'm also now officially a Brit. So I feel like I can really jump in boots and all on, on this one um, to say, I mean, I think it's a great question in a really um, articulately put by Alex. Um, and, and the first thing I would say is, you know, to a statement like uh, what Cleverly made, which was uh, whose values are we talking about? Because the state in a place like Uzbekistan does not represent the values of Uzbekistan or of its people. It represents the values of a nefarious dynastic class of elites who have ruled the country for decades and plan to continue ruling the country for decades and hope to gradually, as we can see very visibly, um, hand over power to their to their, their their juniors in their family who are all being set up in all various positions of power. And it is still the very same people who are in power in Uzbekistan who have been in power for, for uh, over the last couple of decades. They may not be as visible today, but I can tell you um, people like the former head of the SNB are still very much in positions of power in Uzbekistan and are still very much playing critical roles in how uh, in, in how um, life unfolds there and how wealth is divided and distributed. So there's, um, so I would firstly question, you know, the Foreign Secretary's premise. If they're saying we're going to share, act in a way with the shared values with the kleptocratic regime, well, that is a, that is a scary prospect because you're saying then we're going to work pro pragmatically with what is um, a, a, a really problematic regime, and we're and we're um, going to, as as Alex points out there, where we can make a bit of money, improve a bit of trade. Um, and, or, 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 you know, create a few um, security alliances, great, and that's what we'll focus on. Um, I think that is a, is a real, is a real, if that transpires to be what the UK does over the next couple of years, I think that's a real shame. 
And I agree with you, um, the, 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 Adam, that, that we shouldn't see things through a Russian lens, but I can say directly from the investigative work I've been doing over the last two years, that the Russian regime uses corruption to compromise people. It is an imperial power. It has imperial designs. It wants to um, increase its sphere of influence. It wants to increase its level of control over what it sees as its own satellite regions. And it's been doing that very successfully in Uzbekistan. There are a lot of senior political figures who are right now uh, in their position, courtesy of their relationships with the Kremlin and are, and are deeply compromised people with a bucket of, 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 of compromat that, that, uh, that the, the Russians hold on them. And so by playing and not and not working with the people of Uzbekistan to counter that, the UK is digging its own grave as, a, 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 you know, it is, it is, uh, and that's, and that's a real, real problem. Um, but I'll, I'll, I don't want to dominate, so I'll hand over to my... No, no, thanks, Chris, that's helpful. And, and, and as you say, one of the links between, the, the links with the Kremlin include the use, potential use of the Uzbek and other countries in the region's banking systems as ways of, of getting around the sanctions. Uh, against particular people. Uh, so there's I think this is something the UK needs to be very mindful of and should be making sure that it has, uh, obviously, the, the government removed its NCA presence on the ground uh, in Central Asia uh, earlier on this year, which was very poor timing. Uh, I think, you know, there is a, a, a clear uh, need for, for greater money laundering focus, even if, if, uh, if only in relation to uh, sanctions uh, avoidance uh, coming through Central Asia uh, rather than Russia. Um, do uh, Ajahn or want to touch on anything in terms of how the UK, uh, the UK's general strategy impacts on that, or is that uh, a bit too niche for, from where you're sitting? Yeah, I could probably comment on that a little bit. Um, the problem with uh, an approach like this is that it agrees with Putin's policy that human rights is something that could be interpreted and it denies the universal nature of human rights as, as they are fixed in the United Nations Charter on Human Rights. And I think that creates a huge problem uh, in terms of values and how they are, how human rights are interpreted on the ground. And that opens up uh, the door for many more violations of human rights in the region, in addition to what's been happening so far. And as you know, President Putin declared that the Western version of human rights focuses on individual rights too much, and that should not be the case in other parts of the world. And unfortunately, Central Asian countries, especially Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, often follow the suit of Russia, and they start adopting the similar uh, bills, similar conceptions, similar rhetoric, even when it comes to the perceptions of other countries, they start adopting the similar narratives which are used by Putin and his regime. So I think in this regard, it's not that uh, FCDO can abandon it uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, if you abandon it in Kyrgyzstan or any other Central Asian country, you're abandoning it around the, the world as well. You're equipping the countries uh, like Russia uh, to pursue the narratives that they have created the fun foundation for justification for the attack on Ukraine. So that has far reaching implications if, if you agree with, with such approach, I'm afraid. Thanks. Thanks, Sergeant. Um, brilliant. Elisa, do you want to, to yes, come in? I, just, I, I wanted to add that uh, I see a point in this uh, new idea of shared values, because, you know, uh, unfortunately, right now, the vast the majority of the population of Kazakhstan, they under the heavy attack of the Russian propaganda, and every day on their TV on their TVs they see this uh, discussion that uh, there are our traditional family values and there are the other you know wrong values of the West, you know perverted values and so on, you know as they uh, uh, as they're being described by the Russian uh, propagandists. And this idea of the shared values can be actually used, I think, to uh, to promote human rights and better protection of human rights. Because, for example, in the Constitution of the Republic of Kazakhstan, in Article One, it is said that uh, it is written that uh, the highest value of the government of the country of Kazakhstan is a human being and their life, their rights and freedoms. 
So I think indeed this is a very powerful message uh, and it is very important that uh, this idea um, has been you know, um, entrenched and uh, it was written down back 30 years ago in our constitution. So I think if uh, the UK has discourse on shared values, the shared values are indeed a human being, a human life, human freedom, uh, human rights, freedoms, uh, well-being of the population. And definitely this is uh, something where the UK and Kazakhstan could definitely work to improve uh, the quality of life, the standards of life of our people, and uh, basically uh, improve the treatment uh, of uh, people in Kazakhstan. And this could also uh, further, you know, uh, translate into better protection from violence, better pro protection from torture, uh, and so on. So I think, yes, if uh, this discourse goes in this way, this will actually bring uh, more good to Kazakhstan. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Leda. Um, I've got a couple of questions in, in the Q&A box now. I'm going to take uh, Jonathan and Marek's questions together and then take Eka's two questions together, if that's right. So firstly, so Jonathan asks, um, perceptions. The, what are the perceptions of the UK in your respective Central Asia example countries at a government and population? How can the UK build on its status or increase its understanding? And then Marek has said, uh, is it fair to say the West is now unable to counter growing space for Russia to recolonize Central Asia because of its preoccupation with Ukraine? And what kind of iteration can we expect this recolonization process to take economic, cultural, political? Can the UK make a difference in any in any such context? And what I would actually, in response to Marek's question, is point out that what's been really interesting is that since the, uh, since the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, Central Asia hasn't entirely fallen into line behind the Kremlin in the way that you might expect it to. I mean, particularly Kazakhstan, given the fact that they had CSTO troops in in, in January. They're playing. I mean, it's a complicated picture, a very complicated picture. But it's uh, but it, it's. I'd be interested to see how people see that. So basically, how is the UK currently seen in Central Asia? And building what Khalid has just said, what is there anything more that we can the UK and working with others? I would gently argue uh, to try and push back against Russian influence in the region, uh, particularly at this time of strategic importance there. And then we'll come to Eka's questions separately, if that's right. Uh, so who would like to go? Aisha, do you want to have a, have a crack at either of those about how the UK is seen in sure. Kyrgyzstan or what? To... Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I don't have hard data, so obviously I haven't done sociological polls to see definitely, but I feel like there is a split opinion about the UK and Kyrgyzstan. So on one hand, some people just repeat the narratives of Russian propaganda and Russian mass media, repeating that Anglo-Saxon uh, forces are trying to take over the world and so on and so forth. So I think that's a very popular narrative in Russia. But then it's it trickles down to the federal channels, to the Russian channels, which are broadcast in Central Asia. It comes through social media, cultural products, and so forth. So it's quite uh, eminent. And there are a couple of newspapers that took <laughs> onto themselves to attack the ambassador of the UK to Kyrgyzstan, saying that he's a, an MI6 agent, which is quite ridiculous. And I think that that is quite obvious. But nevertheless, we start part of a perception uh, of the UK. But on the other hand, a lot depends on what the UK does and who they send as their uh, diplomatic uh, personnel to Kyrgyzstan. So they were quite lucky here with the previous ambassador, Charles Garrett, and his wife, Ver Veronica. Veronica? Yeah, yeah. So they've been really good in terms of engaging with the public. And I think they single-handedly improved the perception of uh, the UK and Kyrgyzstan quite significantly focusing on such issues as climate change, disability rights, uh, healthy lifestyle. So they as personalities, I think they, they contributed a lot to the improving of the image of uh, UK and Central Asia. So it depends a lot who's going to come next and how they would manage to engage with the public here. But because Kyrgyzstan is quite small and the diplomatic uh, community is quite small as well. So a lot of emphasis is actually given to the diplomats but also who comes from the UK and that's why sometimes it's important to have a bit more attention as in visits of senior officials to the region or visits of senior officials to Kyrgyzstan to increase the visibility of the country and be clear about the purposes, objectives, interests of the British politics here because in the absence of that clarity uh, there is this fertile soil for all sorts of conspiracy theories which are counterproductive for the British interests in the region. Thanks, Sergeant. Clear. 
Yes, I would like to add that, you know, at the grassroots level, unfortunately, the majority of the population in Kazakhstan, they are not aware about all these fantastic initiatives and projects that the British government has been supporting, supported, you know, so far in Kazakhstan the last 30 years. Like we, the experts, for example, uh, we know about these uh, projects and we are indeed very grateful uh, to the UK government for all these efforts and assistance. So that's why I believe right now uh, it may be good uh, for the British government to increase its uh, to increase maybe information campaigns you know at the grassroots level at the um, to sensitize you know and inform the local population about the projects they have you know um, what difference uh, such projects uh, have already brought to the quality of, to to in improving the quality of life of the population, what other uh, positive consequences uh, will be brought about by these projects uh, in the longer term, uh, in longer term. So I think uh, this is very important because otherwise, uh, again, all the channels uh, right now in Kazakhstan are either uh, coming from Russia or and the majority of the population are watching the Russian television in Kazakhstan and again because of this language barrier uh, of course people would be listening uh, to the and watching the Russian uh, TV channels in Kazakhstan so maybe yes uh, this um, such campaigns such information campaigns uh, they may help improve you know the attitude of the local population uh, towards uh, the UK government thank you thanks Chris, do you have anything to add? I mean, obviously you can't speak on behalf of the Uspect people, but no, in but terms I of your say, analysis. I mean, I obviously spend a lot of time, again, I, I don't have a sociological sample, but I do spend time, intimate time, with the victims of human rights abuses. So I've been working with people who are being forcefully evicted from their homes and uh, um, across urban centres in Uzbekistan, people who own their homes, own the land, and are being summarily kicked out to make way for corrupt developments. And, and um, you know, when we're, for people in that position, um, you know, it, they, they, they feel hopeless because there's no recourse or remedy in country. They, appear, I mean, the, 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 they have no, they appeal to the courts, they appeal to the ombudsman, they appeal to the anti-corruption agencies, and the answer is always the same, uh, despite the fact the law is on their side, despite the fact that it's their rights that have been violated, the answer is always no, uh, no remedy. And, and, and so people often then look to the international community in that moment of isolation um, for an answer, for support, for solidarity. And I think often they come in with an idealistic sense that, that, that people will care because there are people outside of Uzbekistan who share their values, who share their concerns. And they are often very sorely disappointed that when they do seek remedy outside, the doors are shut. There isn't remedy, there isn't care, there isn't attention, um, whether it be from the um, uh, governments or from even the media. Um, and I think that then um, creates a, a, a sense of even greater isolation. Um, and, and just to say, in terms of that um, Russia question, I mean, I think in, in, in Uzbekistan, the, the question of how Russia or, or what Russian influence uh, or imperial designs look like, I think the answer there, I can get part of the answer is it's, it, it looks like um, cl close relationships between the security services in both countries. It is the, that is the source of power in Russia. It is also uh, a major source of power in Uzbekistan, and they are closely interlocked together. And therefore, as long as the security services in Uzbekistan prosper and call and have significant collateral, then so does the Kremlin. Um, um, there is also um, uh, compromised uh, politicians who, who are close to the Kremlin, who, um, uh, who have their position as a result of Kremlin support and therefore have a loyalty to the Kremlin and they would be very influential people indeed. You could probably guess even some of the names that I might might say, but won't because I haven't got my libel lawyer sitting next to me right now. Um, and, and also, obviously, it's also going to look like control over strategic resources. Um, you know, the, the big resources, the ones that generate the, the, the significant international uh, returns. And it's going to look like Russian financing of those resources and control over those resources. 
Um, yeah, so yeah, I'll stop here. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Chris. I mean, I, I think just to, to further on Marek's point, I think the um, uh, we have a there is a gap in part bandwidth created in terms of the focus within the FCDO switched to Ukraine in terms of people being taken off the Central Asia desk and moved on to responding uh, to the Ukraine crisis. Um, and just because the UK doesn't have the capacity to do everything at the moment in terms of where its resourcing is in its foreign policy and aid policy. But there is a strategic gap in Central Asia because of the tensions with Russia and obviously, you know, territorial concerns that are stimulated in, in Kazakhstan and everything else that would give space for a strategic yeah, uh, uh, the, the, if a strategic and well-coordinated approach was made by Western countries working together, including the EU, um, there would be there would be some opportunities there. But at the moment, some the sense is some of that gap is being filled by China expanding its its role as the alternative power to Russia in the region. Obviously, the trend that's been happening uh, for a number of years in any case, but the, the, it's uh, it's created opportunities that the Chinese are better able to to exploit than uh, than the West is at the moment. Um, Pick, you're going to take Eka's two questions together. Um, she, uh, Eka from uh, Yoko Bishvili from uh, OSF, has has raised one, one point specifically about uh, Uzbekistan and the one more broadly. Um, Eka says, we see an increasingly aggressive and bullish diplomacy deployed by countries like Uzbekistan. For example, they bullied the World Bank into adopting the country strategy for this year and for the next four to five years without public consultation. What, uh, what uh, can... Uh, to, countries like the UK and others do to counter such behaviour, uh, what what, exits, what can we do with against such British diplomacy, and what are the role of uh, CSOs in supporting uh, you know, pressure, uh, sort of pushing back against dipl diplomacy, uh, particularly as it, in terms of how international institutions are re relating to Uzbekistan and elsewhere in the region. And then the second point is, she notes more broadly that the Uzbek parliament has just published a draft law on, on work on regarding propaganda, uh, uh, probably, in, I, I've not seen the text of it, but in, likely in line with uh, with, with other uh, anti-propaganda efforts, which have turned to be mechanisms to restrict free speech elsewhere in the region. Um, but and she argues, doing doing business of any sort with uh, with any of the central countries at the moment is simply criminal. Would you agree? Um, I think so. Uh, I will throw that open to. I mean, Chris, do you want to have a crack at those first? Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um... You know, that has been one of the um, really um, troubling tendencies we've seen over the past six years. We've seen a much more um, sophisticated kleptocracy in Uzbekistan, uh, where they are much, it's younger, it's much more commercially literate, it's much more cosmopolitan, and it is much more sophisticated at presenting a, and projecting a palatable international image. Um, and what and, and 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 then what is troubling is that we've seen both diplomatic partners and also the international financial institutions being prepared to accept all these different representations as true without much um, critical uh, examination. And we've seen, I mean, you've seen each year these boozy international conferences being held in Tashkent where the great and good from the, um, you know, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the EBRD. And of course, I could also note that when they, they finished working for the EBRD, they just happened to show up as the advisor to the president. Um, you've got, I want to slip that one in. Um, you've got, um, and they sit in these international stages and they talk about this miracle. I mean, in this kind of um, Walt Disney style, style language, like Uzbekistan is this miracle. It has risen from the ground under the wise um, guidance of President Mirziyayev. There's now milk and honey across the streets of Uzbekistan. Freedom is, is blooming like lotus flowers in the spring. And, and you sit there and you sit there with your friends in Uzbekistan and you think, what planet, what galaxy do these people sit within? And how do they actually sit there with a straight face and do this? And, 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 and the answer to what they can do it's just stop doing it. Stop because when they 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 salivate and they applaud and they clap and they play the court jester, they then help um, to sanctify 
that message. They help strengthen that message uh, uh, and, 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 and those. And, they, um, and, and that's very important to the Uzbekistan government's international model. It wants to improve its commercial image so it has better access to international capital markets and international economic systems. And they therefore love it when these banks and, and foreign governments simply echo their uh, public lines. So the, the answer is the UK, the US, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, they have to stop um, um, being a loudspeaker for the, that propaganda. They need to stand back and take a much more sober approach. I'm not saying being become you know loud members of the activist community. Uh, I'm just saying that they've got to st stand back, take a much more sober approach say a much more low key approach, do not sit there and, and, and become an echo chamber for propaganda, but sit there and, and, and when issues are being raised by the public in Uzbekistan around projects they're funding that involve abuses, that involve um, injustices, take them seriously, take them really seriously and do work and then raise the voice of those people with the government because the government wants the World Bank support, wants the Asian Development Bank support, wants the EBDR support. When they raise an issue, it reverberates. And so if they just stopped echoing the propaganda and started to take the voice of people seriously in Uzbekistan and raise them, that would be a magnificent thing um, in a nutshell what they could do. That's brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, Leader. Yes, uh, well, definitely uh, what I want to add is that here in Kazakhstan, we also see some moves uh, from the government uh, to copy the policies uh, of Russia on, uh, for example, um, on propaganda and, for example, on uh, punishment for criticizing the army. For example, just this week, the councillor to the Minister of Defense, he proposed a new uh, bill to criminalize anyone who is discrediting the army of Kazakhstan or who is uh, spreading uh, some, uh, you know, false news, false information about the army. And this is actually happening um, amidst uh, the high rate of suicide among uh, recruits, among soldiers and actually officers um, in, who, who have been working in the army. Uh, almost every week we get news that uh, someone was murdered or allegedly committed suicide or there were incidents of um, improper behavior, you know, bullying and so on that are happening. Many instances of such are happening in, uh, in our army. And then uh, instead of replying, you know, to the criticism uh, from the public, uh, we actually hear uh, such an uh, such an intention, you know, to criminalize uh, and 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 um, and uh, shut uh, any critic uh, of uh, the army in Kazakhstan. So of course, we as the civil society and uh, generally as uh, the citizen of the country, we take it very seriously and we are opposing such ideas and voice our criticism even further. So I hope I hope that such law. Will would not be, uh, would not pass in our country. Thank you. Thanks, Kaleda. Uh, Aja. Yeah, uh, sorry, what was the question that we are addressing? Basic, basically about business ties with Central Asia, um, about yeah. uh, to, to what extent is it a legitimate approach for a Western country, like such as the UK, to be promoting business ties, given how uh, grim the situation is uh, and there was this obviously specific point about Uzbekistan's diplomacy but obviously you could make the same question yeah. about anything that Kyrgyzstan is doing but it's probably not to be fair Kyrgyzstan is probably too small to be considered for large business deals so in a way we are more interested probably together with the United Kingdom to address the organized crime and money laundering that is happening all around the world but specifically in London for, for some reason it's become a very popular destination for our corrupt officials um, so yeah, uh, maybe not so much business, but more organized crime and anti-corruption for us, uh, specifically in Kyrgyzstan, but also climate change, because that is the biggest issue. And I think this is where Kyrgyzstan needs the most of support in terms of uh, the British expertise, research, solutions, suggestions. And I think that would be probably the less um, controversial, like normatively controversial and uh, an easier uh, way to tackle bilateral cooperation that could further lead to other issues to be discussed between the two countries. No, I think that's right. I think uh, organised crime is is a key issue, and I think it's trying to make the case to the UK that obviously it cuts across a range of different things, everything from the property uh, 
industry in, in, in London, which has, uh, has, has, has various bits of interesting cash from across Central Asia, uh, but through to um, the, you know, the, the, the links with the drugs trade coming out of Afghanistan, in particular, and the, the routes that go through Kyrgyzstan, uh, that end up the drugs that end up on the streets here will um, often pass through those those networks that you've identified there, Aisha. Uh, so, I think in answer to Raka's specific question about, you know, diplomacy uh, that Uzbekistan is doing to international institutions, I think it's in part because there are so few good news stories in Central Asia. There, there was an institutional willingness to drink the Kool-Aid from Mirziyoyev when he came in. And I think because obviously, you know, the situation is better in in certain, in many respects than it was under Karimov, but that is not really saying a vast amount. And I think it's recognising that what you're not seeing is a process of transition to a d d rule of law based democratic society there. What you're seeing is a you know, stable authoritarian, more stable and, uh, and, and more pragmatic authoritarian regime which uh, with it with the, with different parts of the elite that are taking up new economic opportunities and i think the uk needs to be clear-eyed both with in, in the uzbek context and elsewhere about the high risks that doing business with those countries make but not only reputationally and in terms of the values agenda but just literally in terms of the way power structures work within those countries mean that you are as an investor you're always at risk if you don't have proper systems in place that protect your investments um because you know powers within the elite will be swirling around and you will um you know potentially lose out so i think the uk has to be should needs to be much more cautious i would argue on the moral case i'm not entirely convinced that that's where the current government is at the moment particularly in line with uh, uh with uh what uh the foreign minister has said, foreign secretary has said recently, um, but nevertheless, there is also a pragmatic case for greater caution and soberness, as I think Chris said, uh, in terms of what the the extent of opportunities for business development. But ultimately, in a world where our aid is very constrained, that economic those economic ties are ones where you can one of the few areas where the UK could put leverage, uh, but it but it, at the moment it doesn't seem to. To, to be wanting to so yeah it's a challenging time uh, i think Ecker is, is, is my my personal view and i would i would urge great great caution um anyway thank you so so much everyone for uh coming today and as i said at the beginning this is my last uh uh last event uh chairing as the director of the foreign policy center although i've been um uh, my, my role has been very different since since May this year. Um, but I want to thank everyone who has come to these and many previous events over my past five years as director, uh, and wishing you all a very Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah and other holidays that you may or may not be uh, celebrating, but have a lovely rest of the year. And uh, thank you very much to our panellists uh, and to all of you for your comments. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Thank you.